Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today, I have a very special, long, long overdue uh, video, almost to the point of being a slap in the face to the perfumers that I ignored uh, doing this video because, as you guys know, if you've been following the channel, this channel is all about sharing the love and art and olfactive beauty of perfume with you guys. Uh, and one of the video ideas that I came up with long ago was called a perfumer's portfolio video. And if you go back through my channel, you can see lots of different uh, perfumer's portfolio videos. And um, there's a playlist. So if you go to my channel, click on the playlist, click on the perfumer's portfolios, you can kind of watch them all. They are unranked. I'm doing a separate ranked perfumer's portfolio video. So far, I only did one ranked. Uh, and uh, what ended up happening was, so um, I ranked uh, probably one of the most underrated perfumers of all time, in my opinion, which was uh, Anique Minardo. And immediately after I ranked it, I'm talking days, I got Figment Man by Amouage, and I'm thinking that's probably her best work. Seriously, her best work, it would be number one if I re-ranked it right now. And I didn't have it when I did the ranking. That is one of the downside of doing these rankings is, you know, um, I had to go in and kind of just add it in the description later on. But uh, anyways, that's what this channel is about. There are two, you know, very famous perfumers that actually have gotten numerous comments over you know, the almost one year, we're coming up on a one year anniversary of this channel, believe it or not. Uh, next month is actually the one year anniversary, almost a month from today. I think it was uh, December 20th. And um, so long story short is these two perfumers are giants in the industry, geniuses. Um, you know, they're looked at as Hall of Fame legends. You know, they're the some of the babe, they're the Babe Ruths of the uh, fragrance world, of the creation side of the fragrance world. And the two men are going to be Bernard Chant and a gentleman named Raymond Shailan. Okay, Raymond Shailan and uh, Bernard Chant. So this is going to be a dual perfumers portfolio video. Um, and so before we hop into it though, let's do the usual scent of the day as is customary on Channel Ramsey. I hope you guys are excited about this video. I've got six fragrances from Bernard Chant and I have five fragrances from Raymond Shailan we're going to discuss today. Uh, and so this is going to be a good one. I hope you guys enjoy this. I am feeling a little bit under the weather though, so if my throat starts to kind of crack, um, you know, I've got a little bit of a sore throat going on. We did go to that friend's giving uh about a couple days back and met with a bunch of people and so you know that stuff happens i don't i don't shy away from germs i'm one of these people that you know i believe my body needs lots of practice to kill these germs off so i give it lots of practice i drop something on the floor i pick it up and eat it i don't shy away from germs at all i just let my body do what it does best um i still believe in my immune system unlike some people out there okay so let's get into this uh number one we're gonna do scent of the day, and today is actually the first time I wore this, and I wore it to work, and it felt a little out of place. I didn't like it. I don't think I would wear it to work again. Uh, I enjoyed the scent well enough. Uh, there was nothing necessarily wrong with it, other than the first, I don't know, two or three hours is kind of synthetic and a little cheap smelling. It doesn't smell like a Guerlain. It doesn't live up to the beauty of you know, the past Guerlains that probably influenced people like Bernard Chant and uh, Raymond Chailin. Uh, But this is a fragrance that came out in 2014 and it's called Santal Royale. So Santal Royale is um, like the second wave of iteration for this, uh, what do they call this line? Absolutes to Orient or whatever it is. It's something like that. Uh, and originally they released Fragrances like Ensemble Mythique and Sange du Bois de Et, which ended up turning into um, Bois Mastidio. And then, in, that was 2012, and then in 2014, they released this. They released Santal Royale, and there's some more in there too. But um, And Santal Royale, to me, gets the most hype out of this line uh, because it's a huge perfume. So for all of the people out there that are like, beast mode, bruh, this is the fragrance for them. I mean, it is gigantic. It's enormous. If you put 
three spray, if you put a spray here and a spray here and like you spray your hand, everyone will smell you. I'm sure everyone on the office floor today smelled me. It's kind of this rose oud combo is basically what it is. The sandalwood in the dry down is nice, but you have to wait about four hours. I mean, literally, uh, this is a five hour dry down and I'm enjoying it. This is the most uh, enjoyment that I will get from this fragrance. Once you hit that four or five hour dry down and that heavy um, floral oud thing that just smells uber synthetic, uber Middle Eastern style, uh, I just did a fresh spray 10, 15 minutes ago, and it's there. It's huge, uber, you know, uh, floral, rose, oud, with a touch of peach. Um, I think this is probably completely unisex. Uh, I think it would smell great on a woman who can wear, who really likes rose. If you're a man and, you know, you just hear the word rose and run the other direction, this might be one for you to try, but... If you are at the point in your journey where you like fine French perfumery, like yesterday I wore Le Bleu, Eau de Toilette, uh, and I loved Le Bleu a million times more than wearing this. You know, sometimes I ask myself, like, why? Why do I beat myself up wearing stuff like this? To be fair, I have owned this for like six months, and I own this is the first time I've given it a full wear. I have worn it to bed a couple times, but... Um, you know, full wares are really where you kind of understand the scent to me. And so I was worried I was going to hate it when I bought it because it was a blind buy. Um, and, you know, once I heard Eugene, who we'll talk about here in the video later on in the video, his name will come up because he has a fragrance we're going to discuss. But once I heard uh, Eugene say that this has grown on him and he likes it now, because I remember he used to say he hated it. I was like, I got to see what this is about. So I got a good deal on 100 mil and I bought it, you know, but don't pay over 100 bucks for this. I don't think it's worth more than 100 bucks personally. Yeah, it's just, you know, Guerlain is better. That's the thing is Guerlain is better than this. Um, okay, so let's get into this. Let's do this. Uh, let's do this. Let's start with Bernard Champ. Uh, they're both absolutely uh, amazing perfumers. Uh, the thing about Bernard Champ is he was kind of the master of the dry, aromatic Chypre. Okay? That was his forte. That was what he really excelled at and loved. Very similar to, you know, if you listen to someone like Roja Dove, Roja loves Chypres. Uh, I, I've noticed many people who are deep into the perfume game, Chypres are kind of their thing because they're very complex and challenging and they change a lot and stuff like that. Um, and the very first fragrance that I have from him, and to be fair, uh, I don't own all of the fragrances that he created. Just to give you an idea of some of the ones that are missing from the list that are on my potential to buy list. Um, I do not own Aromatics Elixir, which I know is like a sin. Uh, I don't own Beautiful from 1985. I don't own Cinnabar. Cinnabar is probably the one that I want the most, although I also want Aromatics Elixir. Um, and so there are fragrances he created that are huge hits that are not in my collection. So we'll have to keep that in, in the back of your mind as we're going through this. But the first one came out in 1959, and this is from the house of Parfums Grey, and this is called Cabochard. Beautiful bottle with the bow. Uh, I think this is a 90s bottle. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's probably a 90s bottle. Uh, and I hear that the new one that they came out with in 2019, so if you can find one that's like uh, a couple years old, you're probably going to get the newest version. And many people that I trust say that is an absolutely stunning fragrance, that they did an amazing reformulation. It's one of the greatest modern comebacks from, you know, a bad reformulation to a good reformulation they've ever smelled. And I, I believe them and I trust them. However, this is still a really good fragrance. Um, it, it does have this aldehydic, leathery Chypre. And the other thing to mention about Bernard Champ, if you're not familiar with his work, the very first thing that will strike you from the second you hit the atomizer and the juice hits your hand or wrist or neck is you're going to be absolutely wowed by the aldehydes. He is probably the king of aldehydes. No one has tamed aldehydes in the way Bernard Schott has, in my opinion. Even someone like Ernst Bow, who worked for 
uh, Coco Chanel and created number five, the huge aldehydic floral. That's probably the most popular fragrance in the history of the world. I think Bernard Chant was even better at using aldehydes than Ernst Bow. It's almost like he took Bow's work on, on uh, aldehydes and expanded upon it. Uh, and that's the thing about his work that is so impressive, even to somebody today, especially today, especially if you're not familiar with his work, is you could spend, you know, hundreds on Amouages, you could spend thousands on Roja Doves, you could buy, you know, Orto Parisi Niche, and you could buy all this stuff. And I do like all that. I'm not bashing it by any stretch of the imagination because I enjoy getting into the niche side of things and understanding you know, what's popular and stuff like that. But you could buy all the Zerzhoffs you want and all that stuff. And you will probably very rarely, if ever, 99% of the time, you will not come across a fragrance that has so much attention to detail, so much emphasis on the way that the workings of the fragrance uh, move along the curve and transition. You just will not find a perfumer who dedicated themselves as much to the craft as someone like Bernard Jean. It shows in his work every single time you spray it, every single time you wear it, every single time you, you know, pay attention to how the notes evolve and the transitions that happen. You notice that every single thing is in its place. You know, it's like a, it's like a neat freak who has their room exactly how they want it. And if you move one thing, even a touch, they know, right? That's the way Bernard Chant is with his perfumes to me, but they're also extremely complex. I think of these watches with, you know, uh, 20 different transitions or 20 different, you know, pieces that are moving. Um, very complex fragrances, uh, also very deep and, you know, I like his style a lot because he uses a lot of dry notes. Many, Much of his fragrances are very dry and you're not going to get this modern sweetness from them, okay? Uh, and so something like this, if I blindfolded you, if you're like, I'm in my late 30s, okay? If you're my age or younger and I blindfolded you and sprayed Cabochard for you, this version of Cabochard that I have, again, I don't know what the newest one smells like but I assume it's at least similar. And let's say you spray this and put it under someone's nose who's blindfolded. They're gonna say, what vintage masculine from the 50s or 60s or 70s did you just put under my nose? If they know fragrance, that's what they're gonna say. If they know a little bit about fragrance, but maybe they don't know this particular one, they would be shocked that this is a feminine target fragrance. And to be honest, God bless the women of the, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s who wore this because uh, I, think it's, I think it's a breath of fresh air. Today, much of what we smell on women is bubblegum, sweet, you know, childlike, childish is what it is. That sweet note always reminds me of being very juvenile. It's not an adult note. It doesn't give me uh, an impression of somebody who has their shit together. You know what I mean? Something like this does. This is a fragrance for a boss. Uh, this is a fragrance for a man or a woman. And even though this is marketed towards women, this is completely unisex. Don't let the bow and, you know, the fact that it's got a feminine symbol under gender on Parfumo or something put you off. This is, uh, this is absolutely, completely 100% unisex, and the opening, along with those beautiful aldehydes, which I don't think there's words to describe the aldehydes, honestly. The way Bernard Chant uses aldehydes is a blessing. It's almost like a gift. I mean, it's like a gift from God. I, I've never smelled a perfumer ever, before or after Bernard Chant, use aldehydes in his fragrances the way he does. And usually... You know, you have to be very careful with aldehydes because most of the time uh, it's very easy to overdose aldehydes. Just a little bit too much and it ruins the composition. It can ruin the composition. And for somehow the genius of the way he uses the aldehydes, in my opinion, is he uses them in a way where I think with most perfumers you would think they're overdosed. Like it's too much. You should tone it down. And yet, it isn't too much, at least not to me. Um, and I don't know how he walked that line. I have no clue how he stayed on that train track. I really, 
I mean, that's a mystery I don't think I'll ever solve. But again, I'm not a perfumer. I'm just a guy who loves fragrances and gets on here and, you know, just kind of talks about them. That's, that's my thing. Excuse me. So I don't, you know, know the ins and outs of the ingredients. I don't know the different types of aldehydes he's using. I mean, I would love to have somebody teach me or, you know, not teach me to make perfume, but teach me, you know, what they know about what aldehydes he used so I could kind of share that information with you guys. But as just a perfume lover, just know that the aldehydes he used, whatever they are, are, are amazing, one of a kind in all of these fragrances. And the other thing you'll notice is this leathery, dry, um, crinkly oak moss in the base of this and the next one that I'm going to show you here. Basically, the notes are um, aldehydes with uh, galbanum, beautiful green galbanum in the opening. Uh, I would say maybe even a hint of tarragon, my favorite note, even though there isn't. Uh, I say my favorite note jokingly because if you've been following the channel, um, I often say that anytime I smell tarragon in a fragrance, it's one of my favorite, you know, uh, usually it's in the opening and it's one of my favorite, you know, openings. I love tarragon in a, in a fragrance. It's always a good sign. So there's no tarragon listed, at least not in this 1995 version. Um, excuse me, but, um, or maybe this isn't the 95. I mean, I don't know what version this is, but I think it's probably 80s or 90s or early 2000s is my guess. Um, but you get this beautiful green galbanum with ylang ylang, Bulgarian rose, jasmine from grass, um, Moroccan oak moss, uh, vetiver, Tibetan musk, and Indonesian patchouli. And there is this almost like leathery, smoky, you know, almost like a, almost like a, um, woman who kind of tried to smoke a cigarette uh, outside and tried not to get any smoke on her clothes because her husband didn't want her smoking and it was 19, you know, 60. And, you know, it was that, it gives me that kind of impression. Um, like, like, uh, there was somebody smoking, but they were trying to hide it. You know, they were trying to cover it up a little bit. Uh, but the leathery dry down, if you're a fan of leather sheepras, this is one of the best. And we're going to get to a couple others that I like even more, but have to start with Cabochard. And then what he did, and you'll notice he does this with his work over and over and over again, is he'll take a fragrance DNA and it will take him not months, you know, not one year, not two years, but sometimes four, five, six years after he will release another fragrance. And this time, maybe it's even marketed to a different gender, but it feels like kind of a continuation of a previous scent, okay? And it feels like he's constantly tinkering and trying to get everything exactly perfect. So in 1964, this was released. And when this came out, it took the masculine world by storm. If you put this under somebody's nose today and just blindfold them, they're going to say this smells like what uh, a vintage man smelled like from the 60s, 70s, 80s. It was popular well into the 90s. I think once the aquatic you know, um, craze kind of took over. Stuff like this was seen as passe, but I love this stuff. And I, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you can find the bottles, you don't have to go crazy and get some, you know, vintage, uh, $800 bottle of Aramis or anything. You don't have to do that. Just try to find the ones that say cologne because the cologne indicates it was pre when they were, uh, agreed upon doing like eau de toilette, Eau de Parfum, all this stuff. Um, and so the Eau de Toilettes are still good, but if you can find an older bottle of this stuff, everything is amped up. The Oak Moss is better. The Leather Note is better. Uh, it just smells of higher quality ingredients. And whatever it is, whether it's the feeling you're chasing from smelling this in your, you know, um, in your 50s, 60s now, uh, or whether it's your very first time smelling this and you just like the, uh, the vibe today, because this would be considered niche today. That's the thing is many people complain that, oh, this is a, this is a rich person's hobby. You have to have a lot of cash to throw down to participate in this hobby. And while it's true to some extent, it's not necessarily true. You don't have to go buy the 
$2,000 Rojas. You don't. Uh, you can you can find just as good, sometimes even better experiences with something like this. I paid $12 for this bottle, full. And I got another one for like 18 so I have a backup. And I love this stuff. It is um, It is exactly the kind of perfume I like. The opening um, is much more, um, compared to this, the opening of this seems much more impactful, you know. Uh, there's still the aldehydes. The brilliant aldehydes are still there. But it's almost like, whereas here there was this hint of tarragon, even though it's not listed, uh, at least not in Parfumo. Uh, here, you get this deep, dark green artemisia. Uh, with clover and thyme and myrtle and cardamom, spicy. And um, remember I said that dry Shepra, leathery, dry Shepra. And that's really what you get. Uber masculine to my nose. I love wearing this stuff. It just, it puts 99.9% .9 of niche fragrances in the corner crying. Uh, there's no other way to say it. Uh, there is castorium in the older bottles. It's amped up and the castorium is used to create that leather accord. So there's this ambery um, vetiver, which vetiver historically to me has been a very masculine scent. So when you see vetiver in some of these feminine targeted fragrances, um, it gives you kind of an idea. You're, you know, these fragrances to me nowadays would probably be considered masculine on the masculine side of things. Uh, and the next one is actually my favorite. It's actually, uh, if you said, Ramsey, I want you to give me a prototype, okay, a reference leather Shepra, this is probably what I would whip out. And there's many others. Actually, I did an entire video on leather Shepras. You can go check it out. Uh, and I think it was like a top 15 countdown. But this is the one I put at number one for very good reason. And it beat out some amazing fragrances. Leather fragrances are my favorite fragrances of all time. Leather is my favorite type of fragrance. And I put this as the best example of a proper leather Shepra. Because I just, I don't think you can spend your money on a fragrance that is, that is m better than this. No matter how much it is today. No matter what marketing you're seeing from these niche brands, okay? This is to me, the epitome of what a proper leather Shepra is. It came out in 1969, and again, it seems like a little bit of a continuation, okay? So you had Cabochard, you had Aramis, and then in 1969, he goes from Aramis for men, which was a huge hit, to Azure for women uh, by Estee Lauder, okay? So Cabochard from Parfums Grey, Aramis, uh, which... I believe Estee Lauder, oh, I, did they own Aramis originally when it came out? I'll have to get some look into that. But um, they own Aramis now. And then Estee Lauder. So mine says Pure Fragrance Spray. I don't know about, this is a very hard one to track down, you know, because what Estee Lauder did is they um, made this in the United Kingdom for a while. They then transferred their production to the U.S., they then transferred it back to the United Kingdom. So it's really hard to gauge kind of what year it is. And I think they came back to the U.S. or something crazy. So it's like you don't really know what time period you're getting. I got very lucky with this bottle. I didn't pay an arm and a leg for it. Uh, it's one of the fragrances I really guard jealously. I cherish this juice. And what you basically have to look for is the bottle that has the gold that goes down to about here. There are some bottles without the gold that goes down to here. And I'm not 100% sure what the difference is. Uh, if anyone knows, let me know. But I know I can vouch for this one because this is the one that I have. And look at this. I mean, yes, it looks tacky. But let me tell you something. As far as a proper leather Shepra, what a proper leather Shepra could be, I don't think you can do any better than this. Um, there is still the Artemisia deep green touch in the top mixes with the aldehydes. There's a little extra florals um, here compared to in, in Aramis. Aramis, you get a touch of jasmine. Here, uh, they went a different direction. You get rose, geranium, and ylang-ylang. So it's a little bit of a different floral heart. 
the dry down will still remind you a little bit of Aramis. Um, but you know what's amazing about this is the texture. Like, look at the way my finger runs over this bottle. The texture of this fragrance, of this bottle. That's what the fragrance feels like. It's the most textured fragrance I think I've ever smelled. It is um, the way that the uh, oak moss lends this 3D surrealism, almost like you can run your hand across the uh, bark of the tree and feel the uh, bark or the actual oak moss on the tree. You know, it has that texture, that 3D texture. You can, it surrounds you in a way. You can wrap your arms around the tree and feel it. You know, it's a real object. And that's what the juice inside of this wears like. It is a pleasure. Every single time I wear this, I really try to take it in and enjoy it. Uh, and I kind of treat it as a treat, be as an honor to wear, because I don't think this type of fragrance is going to be made in the future. I think this type of perfumery is dead. And so the problem is, as perfume lovers, we really tend to guard stuff like this that we love. I mean, this is it. This is the rest of the juice that I have for life. And this is only a, what is this, a two fluid ounce bottle. So, you know, that's that's it. Um, what is that, 60 mil or whatever it is? Um, and I've already put a pretty damn good size dent in it. So I've got about 40 mils left and that's it. And, and I don't think I'll be able to find another one. The prices on these have skyrocketed for whatever reason. Um, so, uh, Azure by Estee Lauder, to me, I think is probably uh, the most underrated fragrance of all time. You know, real fragrance connoisseurs will shout this from the rooftop. Most of the public doesn't know it exists. And Estee Lauder, for the longest time, even when they sold it, they hid it. It wasn't on display. It wasn't like it was just proudly displayed there with all of their other fragrances. No, it was hidden behind the counter. Like it was naughty. Like it was sinful. Like Estee Lauder was ashamed of Azure, which uh, is just, God, what a fragrance, man. Uh, and the fact that women used to wear this. My God. I, I just, you know, I'm trying to imagine a woman in the 1970s walking around uh, smelling like this. It's, it's hard to do because we're so used to, um, you know, we're so used to these modern bubblegum perfumes. By the way, there's one thing, uh, I forgot to mention as far as, uh, Bernard Shant's like contribution to modern perfumery. Um, there is a fragrance that a niche perfumer actually, uh, directly credited Bernard Chant's uh, creations for influencing this fragrance. It's a new fragrance. Let me look up when it came out real quick. Um, it's from the house of Ducita, and it's called uh, Le Siage Blanc. And Le Siage Blanc came out in 2017. It's a green Chypre, but that Chypre element, um, that oak moss, uh, and the tobacco and that green galbanum with the oak moss and leather and artemisia is directly influenced by Bertrand Duchefort's work in Cabochard and Aramis. And she directly said that in her um, interview. Uh, and so, you know, that's her little poem that she wrote about it. So even today, now, uh, it may seem like these are fragrances from a long, long, long time ago, and they are, but they are so revolutionary even today that they are influencing the work that's being done. Light fell on us, a discreet light, making its paved way through the chill and dusty air as I was reading your love. It's a poem for Les Cieurs Blanc. So I'll do an early impression of uh, Les Cieurs Blanc very soon. I've got enough juice, thanks to one of you, to spray it at night or something and talk about it. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd point that out when I when I saw that it was it was uh it was very interesting to see that you know Bernard Chant's uh, work all of these years are influencing people like Ducita. Okay, so next on the list is probably I think I think 
the most underrated rose patchouli. Okay, now I want to talk about this genre, and it came out in 1973, and this is called Aramis 900. Now, I don't have Aromatics Elixir, which came out two years earlier. So some people would say, well, that was actually the greatest uh, rose, patchouli, shipra, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this was influenced by that. But remember, Bernard Chant likes to work on his work year, years after sometimes and then release another iteration of it, if you will. And I think he did that with Aromatics Elixir. He released Aromatics Elixir for women in 1971, which was brought by, you know, was um, apparently accepted with much fanfare. Clinique put that out. Estee Lauder uh, owns Clinique now. I don't know who owned them back then, if they were their own brand or what, but he did that for Clinique. And then he went back to men. So he went from women to men with Cabochard and then Aramis, and then back to women with, uh, with um, Azure, which all kind of share this connection. And what he did with Ar Ar Aramis 900 is he went Aromatics Elixir for women, Aramis 900 for men. Now, this fragrance for men, when it came out in 1973, was extremely daring. And this is a vintage bottle. I hear that the new stuff is still quite nice, okay? It's not gonna have the civet in this though. You may think that's fine, all right? I'm just gonna tell you right now because the civet in this can be challenging. Uh, there's this animalic civet in the base and it does not hold back. It lets its claws out. It's a, it's a serious civet note. Uh, and whether they used real civet in the 70s or some animalis note or what, I don't know. I have no clue, but whatever it is, it's beautiful. Uh, but it's challenging, okay? Even sometimes to me, I'm like, wow, that civet in the base is insane, mixed with the oak moss and patchouli. And um, so spicy floral, 1973, there's green touches in the top. There's a little bit of uh, coriander. Uh, rosewood is, is present. You can pick up some rosewood. Uh, in the heart, you get spicy carnation with geranium, which geranium will sometimes give off this lemony, spicy, rosy-like smell. So they, he used geranium to mix with the rose with orris root, which he loves using orris root. It gives it a little bit of this powdery poshness. Uh, I love iris and orris and all of them. I mean, I, one of my favorite notes. Uh, Lily of the Valley, Jasmine, Oak Moss, Patchouli, Sandalwood, Vetiver, and Civet. Now, in modern times, Many people, when you think of rose patchouli, what do you think of? When you think of rose patchouli, what do you think of? You probably think of something like Frederick Mall's Portrait of a Lady, right? Portrait of a Lady, which I have a decant of right here, and I will do a full review before this juice is gone. Um, Portrait of a Lady is considered by many to be uh, probably the gold standard for rose patchoulis nowadays. And that's the thing is rose patchoulis are now kind of like a dime a dozen, right? Um, there's a new rose patchouli uh, that I like even more than Portrait of a Lady. And you could call this the best rose patchouli. Um, but however you want to, whichever one is your favorite, you have to say that Aramis 900 is a huge influencer of this style of fragrance. This deserves much love. It deserves much adoration, and even more so than it gets now. It gets a little bit of love, but not as much as it should. But my new fine um, fragrance for 2022, probably perfume of the year, is uh, Le Douleur Exquise by Les Abstraites. I haven't smelled the new um, Belle Ami, uh, which I love the name, by the way. But uh, this is Eugene's brand, and Antoine Lee created uh, La De, created all three. There's a, it's a trio of fragrances to begin with, and this is an amazing rose patchouli. And you know, as far as like modern rose patchoulis go, I don't think you can do any better than this. This is perfume for perfume lovers. This is um, there's this uh, animalic spicy. Um, there's this animalic spicy uh, castorium note that comes through. And the castorium, once it comes out in the base, 
I think is the best castorium I've ever smelled since Antaeus. How's that for a statement? Um, I think this competes with Antaeus for, for that level of castorium. How they did it in 2022, I have no clue. All I know is that um, Antoine Lee loves vintage fragrances. Stuff like Bellamy actually influenced him greatly. And if you've ever smelled Les Jus Sans Fates, I'm sorry, that's not correct. Uh, if you've ever smelled, there is a, a Tat Libre de Orange fragrance uh, called... Um, hang on, let me look it up and I'll tell you just because I'm on this... I'm on this roll and I want to tell you what it is while I'm thinking of it. Uh, what is it called? What is it called? Uno momento. Don't go anywhere. Je suis un homme is what it's called. I think it means I am man. Uh, Je suis un homme in 2006 he put that out. And you might look at the note listing and say, okay, cognac and leather and patchouli, animalic notes and myrtle and all this stuff. It is literally a niche version of uh, Bellamy. I think Bellamy heavily inspired Je suis un homme. And, you know, with modern cognac notes and some animalics and stuff like that. Uh, but, and I think that rose, the, the rose patchouli here was inspired in the top by something like Aramis 900. And in the base, something like Antaeus. Um, so whatever your favorite rose patchouli is... Aramis 900 deserves to be, um, it deserves to be credited for much of what followed. This was all the way back in 1973. And think about the chance, you know, the, the, the risk that he was taking putting out something that kind of smells like Aromatics Elixir a little bit, uh, but it's for men. And I love this stuff. I'm so happy to have this bottle. Um, you know, the older ones look like this. There's even a, a different type of uh, vintage bottle that you'll find. Um, it kind of looks like a blue uh, tin can, if you will, with Aramis 900. So there's a couple different types of bottles, but any form, any form you can get, you should get your nose on this, even if it's the new one for 20, 25 bucks. Grab whatever bottle you can get if you've never smelled that. And you're a fan of Rose Patchouli's. And then in 1977, uh, he put out a fragrance that I think he might have worked on in 72. I'm not sure. I know uh, Francis uh, Kamel is, is credited as the perfumer in Parfumo for Alliage. But um, some say Bernard Chant worked on Alliage. I don't know for sure if that's true or not. But I will tell you that it is, it is a very similar trend that he did. So Alliage is very similar to Devon. So Devin's the one that came out for men in 1977. Aliage came out in 1972. But look at the trend I was just showing you. Women's fragrance, men's fragrance, men's fragrance, women's fragrance. Similar kind of styles with tweaks. And so he was, think about how early he was on this gender bending uh, bandwagon. Because now everything's unisex, which actually I don't like. I like that they used to issue stuff for men or for women. Now, I could still wear a woman's fragrance. I don't care. But I liked I liked what Amouage did, how they had, you know, the men's version, the women's version. Um, but he was on this. He understood even back then that those boundaries of for man, for woman were kind of coming down. And so he put out Devin in 1977. And this fragrance is... Um, I mean, it takes so many like facets of perfumery and kind of combines it together. It's hard to really talk on this because it uses that genius, um, you know, master stroke of aldehydes in the top that I was talking about earlier with Cabochard and Aramis and Azure. The aldehydes in those fragrances are out of this world. Uh, and he keeps that with Devin. Excuse me. I'm going to grab a lozenge so I can continue talking and my voice doesn't crack on you guys. There we go. Okay. So, with Devin, 
what you get at the beginning is you get that genius Bernard Shaw aldehydes, which only he can create. I mean, when you once you get a chance to smell his portfolio, his lineup, you will realize what I mean by you've never smelled such aldehydes. I mean, not before, not since. But here, he's mixed Devon with um, lots of green notes. So in the 70s, green Sheepras were very popular. Things like Chanel number 19 took off like a rocket ship. And Devin um, plays a little bit on that green note. So lots of galbanum, lots of mugwort, uh, which is Artemisia, and this perfect execution. One of the best executions you will smell of stone pine needles. I mean, perfection with this very traditional masculine lavender. Okay. So imagine a uh, beautiful lavender, which is a little bit herbal with beautiful citruses, that aldehyde that is out of this world and the most genius green setup with a dry down of a leathery sheepra proper. Okay. Because again, he's a student of perfumery. So this is proper sheepra, the labdanum, the oak moss, uh, the bergamot in the top, all the, the perfect structure, you know, almost like he made it exactly how uh, a teacher of perfumery would teach him to make it, right? It's that good. Uh, and don't let the fact that this says country cologne scare you. This stuff is easily you'll get a work day from this, at least this bottle. I don't know about the new stuff. But I do know that some of that animalic, challenging, forced floor-like vibe that you kind of get here is missing in the new one. Um, maybe this one is worth hunting down a vintage, but again, if you've never smelled it, even the new one I think is probably good. Um, but the vintage is maybe not objectively better, but uh, I would go for the vintage if you asked my opinion. And finally, one more Bernard shot, and then we're going to get to Raymond Chalet. Um, Finally, the final fragrance from 1982. Uh, this came out. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is Aramis's JHL, which is a master stroke. Uh, if you like fragrances like Cinnabar, which I don't have in my collection, but I really want a vintage Cinnabar. It's high on my list. Not as high as Guerlain's Metallica, but it's high. And, or if you like fragrances like this. Does everyone know what this is, class? This is Estee Lauder's Youth Do. And this came out in the 1950s for women. It was originally a bath oil that took off because they figured... You know, women might be a little hesitant to spend that much money on a perfume, but they'll spend it on a bath oil because everyone needs baths. So they did the bath oil and it, again, took off like a rocket ship. One of the best selling fragrances for women uh, from, let's say, our grandmother's generation, if you will. In the 50s, Youth Do was a huge hit and it was created by a woman named Josephine Catapano. Now, Josephine Catapano is a very interesting lady uh, because this is probably one of the most underrated uh, Orientals of all time. Spicy, ambery Oriental, perfect for this kind of weather. It's November 22nd today. November 22nd, perfect for weather like today. And this is also very deep, very... Um, uh, there's so much depth there's so much depth to it. It's not just, don't just think cinnamon and amber and benzoin. No, this is deep. There's flowers, there's uh, fruity notes, there is green notes, uh, there's spices, so beautiful spices. Um, there's wisps of incense, frankincense. I mean, it's, it's a revelation, right? And well worth whatever you can find. You know, I found this bottle for like 17 bucks or something. Absolute steel. I have no clue when it's from. All I know is I love it, right? And what happened was um, 
Joseph Henry Louder, J-H-L, Joseph Henry Louder, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm mistaken, please forgive me. But I think Estee Louder's husband's name was Joseph Henry Louder, hence the J-H-L. And this was supposed to be like a, a bespoke fragrance for him. Because what ended up happening was, is he realized that he really liked Youth Dew. And he really liked Cinnabar and Opium, which were huge hits at the time. Like, gigantic hits. Opium was, you know, out of this world a success. Uh, ditto for Cinnabar. In fact, uh, you know, Estee Lauder with Cinnabar was completely pissed that, um, you know, YSL, you know, she, she figured that, first of all, not only did um, Opium copy Youth Do, but then they copied Cinnabar in a way because uh, I think um, I think Opium came out in 77 and then Cinnabar came out in 78. So it wasn't Cinnabar that she thought they copied. It was Youth Do that she thought they copied. And they kind of did. I mean, if you ever smell this and then you smell Opium, they are very close. Now, I prefer Opium because I just do. I mean, Opium to me is... Um, it made my top 10 fragrances. Let's put it that way. I did a top 100. It was so good it made my top 10. Um, but long story short is Joseph Henry Louder loved that style of fragrance, but he couldn't wear a woman's fragrance. This was 1980, you know, early, late seventies, early eighties. He wanted his own fragrance. He wanted a fragrance for him that was made for men, but smelled like opium or cinnabar or yutu. And so what happened was Josephine Catapano of Youth Do fame, teamed up with the great Bernard Chant, and they created this. This is a vintage bottle, and you can tell kind of by the bottle type and the gold plate on the bottom. Look how they used to put the batch code on. Like, that's cool. Um, and the other thing is, this was a very limited release. They only sold these at certain Aramis counters, certain stores. And what happened was, is about a year or so, maybe a year or two after this came out, he died, unfortunately. And um, they pretty much discontinued the fragrance. So there weren't very many of these old bottles out there that look like this. This is what the original bottle looked like. And what happened was whenever uh, Aramis launched its Gentleman's Collection, which the bottles basically look like this. This is an example of uh, New West in, in its new bottle, but this is what the Gentleman's Collection looked like. So whenever they launched this uh, style of bottles, they put JHL in it. But it took a long time for them to do that. Now, rumor is that Aramis is selling this off to another company or discontinuing it or all of these gentlemen collections could get the axe very soon. And this, I got this for like 20 bucks. This is a fantastic, um, this is a fantastic summer scent. Amazing. I'm, I'm shocked by the value for money to quality ratio of this scent, but that's how it is with many Aramises. And this has this, um, it definitely has this uh, youth do, you know, opium-like vibe to it. Lots of labdanum in the base and vanilla and that warm cinnamon and all the stuff you expect. But there's this big orange, almost like you took an orange and just smeared it down the center of the fragrance. And it runs all the way from the top to the base. Uh, almost if you've smelled that orangey powderiness that you get from something like... Sorry, I changed my... Uh, I'm not in my dress pants anymore. Um, almost if you've smelled that oranginess in Lagerfeld Cologne, Lagerfeld Classic, has this orange, look at the color of the juice. It almost smells like the color of the juice. That orangey, powdery, that's kind of what JHL feels like with the orange. Um, and, you know, JHL is, uh, to me, I think one of my favorite orientals and uh, I'm going to rank my or my oriental fragrances. I just ranked my Sheepras and I split them up. Sorry. 
Uh, I split them up by leather sheepras and just, you know, floral, green, um, sheepras. Uh, and so I, that's, that's kind of how I decided to split them up and I, and I ranked them and that was a bitch, let me tell you. So I think I'm going to do the same thing for Orientals. Uh, and this is going to be very, very close to the top. This is, you know, I love these type of fragrances. I just do. I mean, you take something like Opium and, you know, you take something like JHL. Um, that's why I want Cinnabar so bad. And I want it even more because it's officially discontinued. Even in the newest version, uh, I think. I think that's what I saw. That, uh, or maybe it's just the version from 1978 and then they re-released it. Let's see, Cinnabar. Yeah, so they did like a 2015 version, but I hear it's shite. Um, so I want the older version. And uh, that, that version is discontinued. So these type of fragrances I, I absolutely love. And again, don't shy away from smelling masterpieces like Opium because it's for women. And don't shy away from masterpieces like JHL because it's for men. If you're a woman and you like this category... I would really urge you to sniff this. I think this is the final Bernard Shant fragrance we're going to talk about. And I'm realizing we're almost at an hour. So I think what I'm going to do is we're going to basically stop here. Because uh, I'm getting a little bit hoarse. And uh, Raymond Shyland deserves more than an afterthought on a Bernard Shant video. So I can do a perfumer's portfolio on him separately with maybe another perfumer who only has a couple of fragrances thrown in there and he'll get the majority of the focus. Uh, but let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know what your thoughts are on scent of the day. Let me know what your thoughts are on, you know, the back and forth between the genders that uh, Bernard Schonk kind of played, you know, masculine, feminine, masculine, and then feminine again with similar scent profiles uh, with, with little tweaks here and there. Um, let me know what your thoughts are on the rose patchouli idea, how modern rose patchoulis have something like this to really thank, and I'm sure there's even older rose patchoulis that this, uh, has to, to thank, but, um, I do think this deserves much more love in the community than it gets, and, you know, even some of these Aramis, uh, fragrances that don't get a lot of love, you do not have to spend. This is a great example. Bernard Schant is a great example of you do not have to spend big money to get high-end, intricate fragrances that change a lot and have transitions and are deep and have high-quality materials. You do not have to spend big money to get that. So um, these are classic examples of that, JHL and um, Devon. So let me know what your thoughts are. We'll just leave this as a Bernard shot perfumers portfolio video uh and i'll come back and do raymond shy land with somebody else so thanks for watching let me know what your favorites are hope to see you in the comments i love seeing your faces uh i do still want to do hopefully a live stream soon where we can kind of test these brand new bortnikoffs that lee from fragnanimous was kind enough to send me because i do have the new bortnikoffs uh, i've got samples of them and i want to share them with you guys i want to get the word on the street what they're what they're like um so hopefully we'll do a live stream soon. I have no clue when that is, schedule permitting, but um, let me know what you think. I appreciate the support, everybody. Cheers, guys. You guys are amazing. And see you again tomorrow. Bye now.